We talked about all that's necessary to come to Jesus. And we introduced the fact that baptism is essential for salvation. Apart from that, there is no salvation. So tonight we want to talk about what baptism itself is. Now, baptism is not the most important subject you can talk about. Jesus and God is the most important thing you can talk about. The knowledge of God. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Let him that is wise glory not in his wisdom, nor he that is strong in his strength, nor he that is, that is rich in his riches. But let him be glory, glory in this, that he has understanding and he knows me that I am Jehovah. Know God. The study of God is the greatest study in the world. So that's the most important thing in the world. But baptism is a crucial, is crucially important. It is at the heart and the center of Christ. Baptism, the sovereign God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All of them gave baptism an important part in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God originated baptism. didn't come from man. Jesus was baptized. Jesus baptized thousands, although the disciples, according to John 4, did most of the baptizing. But it was because of Jesus that multitudes were baptized. And not only that, His last commandment was baptized. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. In the New Testament, no one argued about baptism. They simply commanded and people simply obeyed it. Argued about baptism come along years later. It came along in the Catholic Protestant debates and the interdenominational debates. In the original time, in the first century, and in the centuries that followed, they didn't have any argument about baptism. They all knew what baptism was. Until false doctrine started entering in to the teaching. Scholars like Beasley and Murray in their book that's written, The Believer's Baptism, on page 68, they say, quote, to limit baptism and saying it is not required is unknown to Paul. It's unknown to Paul. To him, it was for every man the regular means of becoming a Christian. Without it, there can be no Christian. They cannot have it. In the New Testament, they didn't prove baptism. They didn't try to prove baptism. They merely said, you be baptized, and they were. The day of Pentecost, the first day of the church, after the sermon of, of, of uh, Peter, he ends it up in verse 36 saying that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ is Jesus who you crucified. And they were pricking their hearts. And they cried unto Peter and the rest of the disciples saying, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sin you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, to your your children, and as many as are far off, as many as the Lord God shall call. And with many other words, and he persuade them to free yourself from this unjust generation. And we know the result 
about 3,000 of them were baptized on that day. Baptism. He commanded, they were baptized. There was no argument about it. When Ananias comes to Paul and says, Why tarriest thou rise and be baptized? He didn't argue about it. He got up and was baptized. There was no discussion about it in the first century and in the second century and so on. This debating thing came on much later. No one in the New Testament was reluctant about being baptized. We should never be concerned about talking about baptism. Jesus did. He commanded it. The apostles did. And the saints were all baptized to come into Christ. So we want to look tonight real quick at a few things. What to define baptism. Talk about the action of baptism. And then talk about the purpose of baptism, which we talked about this morning. We'll go over that quickly for a review. Baptism defined. Baptism comes from the word, you've all heard it plenty of times. If it's the verb, it's baptizo. If it's the noun, it's baptisma. And it means immersion. It is the process of immersion. This is dictionary definition. It is submersion. The verb is to dip under. And it was used of the Greeks for the dyeing of garments. How many of you have ever dyed a garment? How much of the garment do you have to put under the dye? The whole thing. That was a term that was used in dyeing of garments. They were baptized. We come to talk about baptism, we think of water baptism. The word means immerse something, submerge something under the water. He didn't use the word sprinkle. The word sprinkle is used in the Bible. Hebrews 12, verse 24 speaks of the, the blood of sprinkling. The Christ greater than the blood of Abel. 1 Peter 2, no, 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. It says, according to the foreknowledge of God, the sanctification of the Spirit, through the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. God knew the word sprinkle. And He did not inspire anybody to be sprinkled for baptism. The word pour, the keo in the original language, is used, what have I wrote down here somewhere? 28 times in the Bible. God knew the word. He inspired people to use the word for pouring. He poured out the Spirit. He promised He would pour out the Spirit. He poured out the Spirit on Pentecost. Clear back over when Cornelius was, was before he was baptized, he poured out the Spirit, but he did pour it out that day. Because that verb's in the perfect tense. People don't like grammar, but it has great meaning. And if we don't understand some grammar, we don't understand a lot of things that stated in the Bible. When Peter gets up on Pentecost, he says, this is that which Joel spoke. Joel spoke, in the latter days the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Peter made it present tense on the day of Pentecost. He says, this is that which Joel spake, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out. That was perfect tense in Joel's time. Peter made it present tense in verse 33. He says, 
that has been poured out. That's aorist tense in the original language. means point action in the past. It's done. There's no more pouring out of the Spirit. When you get to Cornelius, that's a perfect tense verb. Pouring out is perfect tense. The perfect tense in the original language means a result of a completed past action. That action was completed on the day of Pentecost and the result was still available for Cornelius. But there was plenty of pouring out. God knew the word. He didn't use the word for pouring out. The English word baptize is not a translation. It's a transliteration. When they translated the old Greek and Latin into the English language, they didn't want to say immersion. They probably lost their head. Because the king of England ordered them to translate it into England. That's back in 1611 where we get the King James from. So rather than translate the word, they transliterated the word and made baptizo to baptize. It just sounds the same. And our Lord commanded that action for salvation. Mark 16, we spoke of this morning. Verse 15, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will be condemned. The action is immersion. That is the meaning of the word. But God doesn't even leave it to our definition. God tells us in Romans 6, 3 and 4 that we're baptized into Christ. And verse 4 says it is a burial. You're buried therefore with Christ in baptism unto death. Colossians 2.12 having been buried with Him in baptism. We don't have to even go back and find the definition of the word baptizo or baptisma. Let God tell you what it means. God says it's a burial. It's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. It's a burial. In Acts 8 after Philip left Samaria, the Spirit told him to go on the way down in the desert. And he runs into the eunuch in his chariot. And the Spirit told him to go join himself to the eunuch. And he takes him up and he's reading Isaiah 53. And it says that Philip started from that scripture, Isaiah 53. That's the one that talks about the servant, the suffering servant. That's the one he says, that surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. And Jehovah laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was what the eunuch was reading. And it says that Philip started from that verse and preached unto him Christ. Somewhere in the preaching of Christ, he talked about baptism, because when they come in about verse 36, when they come to a certain water, the eunuch said, here's water. What does it hinder me from being baptized? Philip says, if you believe, you may be baptized. He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot stand still. They both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they both come up out of the water. The Spirit called Philip away, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. 
You don't have to go down into the water to sprinkle somebody. God said it is a burial. And the action of burial agrees with the definition baptized. The purpose of it we talked about this morning. So we'll shoot over those quickly. Jesus says, it will be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. John 3, 3 through 5, Jesus says, except a man be born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, how can a man who is old be born again? How can he enter into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, verse 5, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot Enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, He cannot, enter, except He be born of the water, that's baptism, and of the Spirit, that's guidance and learning through the Holy Spirit. You can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, It is for the remission of sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. We talked about that this morning. It is to wash away sins. It is to put one into Christ. It is to make man a new man. Your ignorance means baptized into Christ. Baptized into his death. You're buried with him through baptism unto death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So also you should walk a newness of life. It is to put one into Christ. And to clothe him in Christ that we talked about before. You're baptized into Christ. From without Christ, into Christ. As we saw this morning, there's two verses that tells you how to get into Christ. Both of them says it's baptism. Romans 6, 3. Galatians 3, 27. And it clothes us with Christ. We're hidden in Christ. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is everything. 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, verse uh, 30 tells us of Him, that's of God. Of Him then are you in Christ Jesus who was made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is everything to us. And if we're hidden in Jesus, in God's sight we're holy and righteous as Jesus is. Because God sees Jesus. We saw in chapter 3 of 1 Peter, verse 21, it's baptism. In like figure does now save us even baptism. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. It's not washing your body. But the interrogation of a good conscience towards God through the redemption of Christ Jesus. It puts one into one body. We all in one spirit are baptized into one body for the Jews or Greeks. You make the drink of one spirit. These things are the purpose of baptism. It washes us. In Ephesians 5, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Having sanctified, what's the word sanctify mean? Set apart. To set apart. The word sanctify comes from the word, the same root word is holy. Holy comes from the word hagios in the original language. It comes from two words. Hagios comes from two words. It comes from ah and gay. Not gay like we have today, huh? Gay in the Greek language is the earth. And when you put an A in front of something, what's that do to it? Makes it opposite. Opposite of the world. You're called out of the world. You're called to be holy, not like the world. That's the reason God is holy. If you wanted to name one characteristic of God, what would you say? Probably a multitude to say he's love. Well, he is. But when you have holy angels, 
the cherubim, the seraphim, Isaiah 6. They play around him, each having six wings, with two that cover their eyes, with two their feet, with two they fly, and they cried one to another. Why they cried? Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of holy, and the world is full of his glory. You want to talk about one characteristic of God? It's holiness. God is holy. Of course he's love and he's merciful and grace, but God is holy. He is so holy that he has, he has no part in the world. God is the creator of all this universe. He is outside of the universe. He created the universe. He sustains the universe. But God himself is out of God. is transcendent God. He's holy. And he calls us to holiness. 1 Peter 1, 15. As he who called you is holy, be yourselves also holy in all manner of living. Holiness. God is holy. Holy. He says in, in that verse, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Having sanctified it in the washing of the water and the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing, but it being holy and without blemish. What did that tell you, husbands? Or us husbands, I am too. <laughs> she remind me. <laughs> it is our duty to present our wife to Christ holy and glorious, just like Jesus did for the church. Because he'll get on down there and he'll say, this is a great mystery, but I speak of the church in Christ. And just as Jesus gave himself because of his love to sanctify us and make us holy, husbands are to do the same thing to their wife and their children. If we don't teach our children when they face God, God's going to ask the fathers, why? I put him in your house under the headship of you. And if you didn't teach them, you may get to go where they go if they've not been taught in Jesus Christ. Because it's our responsibility as men. I said, I guess last night, we have a terrible problem in the church. Men are not being men. They're not teaching their wife and their children the righteous way of holiness. And we're allowing our children to marry heathens. And it's destroying the church. He said, back to this verse, he sanctified it in the washing. The water, the word washing is from Lutron. Lutron is a washing of the whole body, not a part of it. Not a part of it. It's the whole body. To wash it in neutron, it is to have to submerge it and wash it completely. Jesus says that's what he did to his body, to sanctify his body. He did it by the washing, the whole washing of the whole body. With water in the word that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. It is a cutting off of the body of sin completely, we talked about. In whom? Jesus Christ. In whom you were circumcised with a circumcision, not made with hands, and the cutting off of the body of the flesh and circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, wherein? We were raised together with him through faith and working to God who raised him from the dead. Who is to be baptized? Who is to be baptized? Who is a candidate for baptism? Adults. 
not children, not infants, adults are to be baptized. And the ones that are to be baptized are those that have been taught. Jesus says in John 4, 40, and 6, 44, No man comes to me except the Father that sent me draw him. I'll raise him up the last day. As is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone that has heard from God and has learned comes unto me. Before you come to Jesus, you have to be taught. You don't teach children about coming to Christ. Infants are not teachable. Babies are not teachable. Those that hear, those that have heard the teaching, that's not babies. That's a people that are old enough to understand teaching. And they have learned. He says, everyone who has heard from the Father and has learned comes unto me. Nobody could really learn and not come to Jesus. Something's wrong with the mind that wouldn't come to Jesus if they have learned the penalty of not coming to Jesus and the glory of coming to Jesus. But it is necessary for somebody to be of the age to be taught, to be able to hear and assimilate the things that he's heard and reason and learn. Anybody other than that is not a candidate to be baptized. He has to be believer. We've used that verse several times. You can all quote it. Jesus says, you'll all die in your sins, except you believe that I am to die in your sins. A child, an infant, can't believe because he can't be taught he can't hear the gospel and learn. It has to be one that is a believer. As I talked about earlier, about belief, that's more than just skin deep belief. That's a belief that Jesus is God. What did we just say the eunuch said? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Son of Mankind is a man. The Son of God is a God. Jesus is God. He is eternal. He had no beginning. He has no end. He is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And He's eternal. And He's holy. And He's everything to us. It has to be somebody repent Talk about repentance this morning, the meaning of repentance. It is a total changing of your mind. And a child, a young child, has not the capability yet to do that. He doesn't need to repent. He doesn't have anything to repent of. He doesn't need to change his mind. His mind hasn't been taken down the path of Satan. He's innocent. A child is as innocent as Adam and Eve was innocent before they ate the degree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were naked and not embarrassed at all because they were innocent. When we went to Thailand, not so much anymore, but when we went to Thailand 44 years ago, the children all went naked. It's warm over there. And I mean children up to 10, 12 years old. They run around naked. Didn't they bother them at all? Why? They hadn't eaten of the tree yet. 
They didn't know the difference between good and evil. They were innocent. They didn't need to repent of anything. It has to be people, people that are baptized or people that confess. They have to take in all this teaching and this hearing and this learning till they believe, until they have a change of mind and they confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus says in Matthew 10, If a man confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whosoever rejecteth me, him will I reject before my Father who is in heaven. Sad sound is there. Just like what I talked about this morning. Depart from me. I never knew you. Confession. He tells Timothy to remember his confession, which is like Jesus' confession before Pontius Pilate, the good confession. Pilate says, Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the King? Jesus said, Yeah, that's what I am. He said that before the high priest. The high priest says, Are you the Christ of blessing? He says, I am. They ripped their clothes and said, He's worthy of death. He blasphemed. Because they either had to kill him or accept him. They had no choice. I used to think, good grief. Just because somebody said he's a king, why would that kill him? You've got to understand the Jews. The claim to be the king of the Jews was blaspheming if it wasn't true, and it was punishable by death. Those Pharisees either had to accept Jesus as the Christ, or they had to kill him. They refused to accept him, they killed him. But it was his death was upon that confession. He died because of every one of these things is necessary before one can come and be baptized. Any one of them, every one of them, if anyone's missing, there's no salvation. We don't believe in baptism salvation, which we'll talk about a little bit. Baptism without belief is useless. Baptism without repentance is useless. Baptism without confessing Christ as your Lord and Master is useless. We don't preach baptism salvation we preach Christ salvation but we say what Jesus says without being in Christ there is no salvation I often tell people they come and say well you think your own one is going to be saved I tell them I believe the same thing you do that always shocks them I believe the same thing you do. I believe you have to be in Christ to be saved. And most people that are, have any conservative to them at all would believe that. And I says our only problem is how do you get into Christ? You have to be in Christ to be saved. How do you get into Christ? That's the point. Christ is the Savior. Our belief doesn't save us. Our repentance doesn't save us. Our confession and our baptism doesn't save us. Jesus Christ saves us. When we believe, when we repent and change our mind about the world and follow Jesus, when we accept Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and He's our Lord of life, when we're baptized into Christ, Jesus saves us. Salvation is from Jesus. He is everything. Each one of these. Absolutely necessary. How about infants? And young people? Where did that come from? It was unknown in the first few centuries. 
But a man named Augustine, about 400 A.D., he was a priest in the becoming Catholic religion. He taught, he brought up the idea of original sin, which continued from that point on. Augustine is the one, 400 A.D., he laid most of the basic doctrines of Catholicism today. Calvinism continued that. Total depravity. Children are born totally depraved. Totally full of the sin of Adam. But when you teach about original sin and total depravity, what are you going to do to your babies? If your baby dies and he's totally depraved, where is he going? He's going to hell. Because of false doctrine, other false doctrine has to follow. Because of the false doctrine of total depravity, of original sin, the parents are concerned with their children. What do we do? We have to baptize our kids. But we don't go around dunking babies under the water, so we have to sprinkle them. We have to pour a little water on their head and call it baptism. It has nothing to do with baptism. But a false doctrine has to follow a false doctrine. So that brings about the point that baptism saves no matter what else took place. To baptize an infant means you don't have to be taught, you don't have to hear, you don't have to believe, you don't have to repent, you don't have to confess, you don't have to do anything. Just a little water on the head, salvation. That's baptism, baptism, salvation by baptism. That's not what takes place. Our salvation is by Jesus. When we're baptized. Baptism doesn't save us. Jesus does. And baptizing somebody apart from being taught and coming to Jesus by the way that God prepared for us to come to Jesus makes baptism the overruling everything. If you're baptized, you're saved. Now comes on clear back. Come on down to once saved, always saved. Well, I'm baptized. So I'm saved. They're not even baptized for the right reason. So they're not saved. Baptism is absolutely essential for salvation. But don't ever forget, it's Jesus that saves you, not baptism. If baptism saves you, then you saved yourself when you were baptized. You absolutely have to be baptized to be saved, but it's Jesus that saves you when you're obedient to what He says. Child, cannot be taught a baby that they take in and christen, whatever they do with it, they call it baptism. He can't be taught, he can't believe, he can't repent, he can't confess, therefore, he can't be baptized. Because those things are the things that Jesus said you have to do before you're capable of coming to baptism. A child doesn't need baptized. As I said before, a child is just as innocent as Adam and Eve was before sin came in. Before they knew right and wrong, Jesus Brings a little child to him in Matthew 18, verse 2. 
And then he tells the disciples, Verily I say unto you, except you turn and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore that humbles himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom. He'll say over in Luke, chapter 18, Suffer the little children coming to me. Forbid them not, for to such belongeth the kingdom of God. Little children are safe. They don't need saved. They're safe. And we have to become like those little children to enter into the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Paul helps us on that. Paul tells us in Romans 7, verse 9. Paul says, I was alive apart from law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Paul said he was alive apart from law. Paul was born under law. Paul was born under the law of Moses. But he said, I was alive apart from law. When could that be? When he's a baby. He didn't know law. He was born under the Mosaic law, but he was not under law. Because he didn't know law. But when the commandment came, Sin revived, and I died. When he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he died. When he came to understand God's will, he became a sinner and died. Sin is a breaking of law. Romans 4, verse 15. The law has read but where there is no law, neither is there transgression. 1 John 3, verse 4. Whosoever sinneth doeth lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Sin is a breaking of the will of God. If there is no law, you can't break a law. If you're not breaking the law, you're not a sinner. A child that does not know, does not know and understand law cannot sin. Because he can't violate what he doesn't even know. He is a safe child. What age does that come about? The age of accountability? To the Jews it was 13 years old. It's never mentioned in the New Testament. Adults were baptized. The age that they become accountable is nowhere mentioned. I would guess that the age of accountability is older than we usually think. Because children become obedient to the gospel, but it's not their faith, it's their parents' faith. They can give you all the right answers because they've heard it. They're raised in the church, they've heard it. They can give you the right answers, but that's not their heart talking. That's just their brain talking. They're not accountable until they understand what that age is. Probably just depends on the kid. Some of us are slow. They can give the right answers. In all of this that I've said, there's nothing about it that is changeable. The Hebrew writer in chapter 6 of 17 says, God being minded to show the abundance to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel. 
interposed with an oath that by two immutable things, that's a promise of the oath, by two immutable things in which God cannot lie, we may have strong encouragement. These are God's words. They don't change. There's the immutability, the unchangeableness of God's Word. It doesn't change. It doesn't make any difference whether you're in the modern age or the old age. God's Word doesn't change. Here back in Malachi, when he ends the Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 6, says, I, Jehovah, change not. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, yea, and forever. There's no change. And people that try to change the church and liberalize the church say, well, those are the commandments for the culture of that time. That's Satan talking. Because God does not change. His Word does not change. Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will pass away. If something needs to be changed, it's us, not God or His Word. His counsel is immutable. It will never change. It will never change. I'm supposed to use other language. Greek uses other languages all the time, but English you can't do that. <laughs> Not supposed to be that. So, I already mentioned this. Pay attention to the prepositions. Again, <laughs> grammar. Before I went to sunset, I could have told you what a noun and a verb was. Past that, I wouldn't have had a clue. Adjective, adverbs, prepositions, they just, they're out there somewhere. <laughs> Listen, they have meaning. In fact, I learned all my English grammar studying Greek. Because the teacher would always say, well, this is like such and such a thing. And I said, it would help me in <laughs> you know, you say a perfect tense. I don't know what he's talking about. Grammar has meaning. And you don't have to study deep in grammar, but you need to know a few things. Prepositions have no meaning without an object of the preposition. But the preposition states action. He says in Matthew 28, verse 19, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The preposition is ace, which means into. That which is outside is goes into, and it means the possession of. You're baptized into the possession of the Father. You're baptized into the possession of Jesus and into the possession of the Holy Spirit. You belong totally to them. If you use the preposition, Acts 2.38, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. The word there, the preposition there is epi, which means on. We translated it in there, my translation. But the preposition means on, and it speaks of on the authority of. Peter says you repent and be baptized, not because I told you so, not because Peter says it, but it's on the authority of Jesus Christ, and it's unto, that's apes, into the remission of sin. But in the name of Jesus is in the authority of Jesus. On the authority of Jesus. In Colossians 3.18, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give you thanks unto God the Father. In the name of Jesus Christ is a preposition in. Because we got some doubling up there. Sometimes it's hard to understand David. In means that which rests within. If this is Christ, in. Which means you are in Christ. Whatever you do in word or in deed, you do it just like Christ does. You think like Christ. You pray every day, like I said. Pray every day, give me the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the compassion, the love of Christ. And everything you do in word or in deed, you do it all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks unto God the Father through Him. That is in Jesus. That's how you operate when you're in Jesus. I already stated Matthew 28, verse 19 talks about you're baptized into the possession of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Titus 2, we're talking about possession. Titus 2, verse 11 says, The grace of God's appeared, bringing salvation to all men. The grace of God covers all men. The blood of Christ calls 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Well, start with 1. These things have I written to you that you may not sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. Jesus has already paid the price of every sin from Adam to the last man that breathes on this earth. They're paid for. All we have to do is come to Jesus in the way that he said to come to it. They're already paid for. How stupid can man get to not come and accept what Jesus has done for him so that they can live eternally with God and Jesus in heaven. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to the intent to deny ungodliness and fleshly lust. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present life. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself of people for his own possession, zealous of good works. We are his possession. When we're baptized into him, we're baptized into his possession. 1 Peter 2 9. You're an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yet every time he talks, he talks about holiness. An elect race chosen from all of Satan's domain. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We're baptized in into the name of the Father. Into His possession. Verse 10 says that there's a purpose that we may show forth the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. In 1 Corinthians 1, Verse 12. There's a problem. Paul says, For I say unto you that you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollo, Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. They were scattered and dividing. And Paul says to them, how does he answer them in verse 13? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Were you baptized into my position? 
He baptized you in the possession of Apollo or Cephas. Christ isn't divided. I wasn't crucified for you. You weren't baptized into my name. Watch the prepositions. They have great meaning. I'm trying to figure out what time I started with. So we started at 6 30. I start at 645? 645. That's what you look at for a while. I do watch. Because I have a long ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> what time did I start? 645. 25 after? 645. 640? Okay, 645. <laughs> Goodness, I've been talking a liar. We better quit here then. Because if I start where I'm going, it'll be longer. There'll be another day, and if there's not, it doesn't make any difference. If there's not another day, I'll see you all then. Amen. <laughs> Baptism doesn't save us. I know 1 Peter 3.21 says baptism saves you. But he says that's not the cleansing of the flesh, but it's an interrogation of conscience, which is through Jesus Christ. Salvation is by Jesus. Jesus bought us on the cross of Calvary. Everything that Jesus says is absolutely necessary for salvation. The hearing, the being taught, the learning, the believing, the repenting, the confessing, the being baptized. It's all necessary. Without any one of those, there is no salvation. That's the immutable counsel of God. And as Hebrews said, to impress the immutability of that, he interposed with an oath. That by two immutable things, his promise and his oath, he can't lie. They're never changing. If we didn't come to Christ by that means, we're not part of Christ. And we have no salvation. Make sure that you're in the right way. We're not talking about physical life. We're talking about eternal life. Don't play with your soul. It's an eternity. Which I always say, I can't even, I can't even grasp it. But there's nothing else there's nothing else that makes any difference. There's only one thing that's important. We live here one time. It's appointed unto men once to live after that cometh the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. And after that judgment, there'll never be any changing. Lazarus died. The angel took him away. The rich man died and was buried. And being in Hades, being in Hades, in torments, on the week 16, about verse 23, 24. He says, and being in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Torments is plural. It's not singular. Torments. And seeing Abraham and Lazarus, he bosom, he cried and said unto Abraham, Have mercy 
Have mercy on me. Said Lazarus, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish of these flames. He's still there. He's still there. And he would like to be extinguished, and he'll never be extinguished. 